Look, we gather tonight in sobering times. Uh, America is being shaken by violence and natural disasters. So many nations around the globe are being shaken by evil and violence as well. And nowhere is that more true than in the epicenter. The headlines emanating from the Middle East are, are in the recent years, are, they're, they're devastating. They're, they're filled with uh, catastrophic uh, headlines, wars, revolutions, uh, insurrections, terrorism, and even genocide. And tonight, I want to pose two questions that I, I think will help us frame this year's Epicenter Conference and put all that we're going to discuss in biblical context. The first question is, what does the future hold for Israel and her neighbors? And the second question is, okay, so what? What are the practical implications of these prophecies for you and I and the church in North America and around the world. Would you turn with me as we begin to Ezekiel chapter 33? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 33, uh, the Hebrew prophet writing more than 2,500 years ago. And it's a passage that I believe will help frame our discussion. Ezekiel chapter 33, uh, we're going to read one, verses 1 through 9. I'm reading in the New American Standard uh, Bible, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning and his blood will be upon himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. But... If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now, as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from me from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your life. Now, obviously, this had a, an Old Testament uh, context, uh, and very, very specifically. Uh, but let's zoom up and put it in a whole counsel of God perspective. The Lord calls followers of Jesus to be if you will, watchmen on the walls, in this sense, to our generation. It is not our responsibility to convince people of the truth of the gospel or of warnings that God gives us in his word of the things that are going to happen. It's not our, our, our responsibility to convince them, but it is our responsibility to warn them. To, to, we can't save them, but we can tell them. We have this solemn responsibility to do three things, in fact. According to this text, if you draw it out, number one, we, it's our responsibility to watch closely what is happening in our world and to truly understand the times in the light of God's word. Two, it's our responsibility to accurately assess the gravity of the threats that are coming against our nation, against other nations, and against the church. And three, it's our responsibility to warn people to repent and to get right with God before it's too late. Now, if we do our part, 
and people refuse to listen, that's a tragedy. People will die in their iniquity. But if we fail to do our part, then we will be held to account. Okay? That is the Old Testament way of laying down our responsibility. Don't be silent. When you know the truth, when you see a threat coming and you know the way to God, we need to tell people. Now, the New Testament uh, metaphor, the parallel metaphor, metaphor, if you will, is that we are ambassadors. Right? The Apostle Paul, speaking in Ephesians chapter 6, says, Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am, in, for which I am an ambassador. Now, he happened to be an ambassador in chains. Okay? But he's an ambassador that in proclaiming, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul did not believe being arrested for the gospel was an excuse to not preach the gospel. If there were a few Roman soldiers tied, you know, chained to him, he, he didn't feel bothered by this. He thought, well, actually, I don't feel chained. They're chained. And for the next couple of hours, I get to share the gospel with them. They can't go anywhere. And when they get released and set free and they attach two, four new guys to me, great. I have their undivided attention for the next few hours. He, Paul saw himself as a sinner who had been adopted by the king of kings and the lord of lords and saw himself as an ambassador. He did not have a message of his own. Ambassadors do not have a message of their own. They're not supposed to. They have a message from their president or their king, and they are emissaries uh, to communicate what the leader wants. Now, what's more, we should follow Paul's example, right? That's what he told us to do. Follow him as he follows Christ. Therefore, we are supposed to serve as ambassadors of Christ and his kingdom in this lost and fallen world. Think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an, making an appeal through us, and we beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus, in Yeshua, in Isa. Now, this is our mandate. We are ambassadors. We are watchmen and we are ambassadors. Now, again, if we do our part and people refuse to listen to the gospel message, to the warning of what happens to you when you die outside of Christ, well, there, that's a tragedy. But if we fail to do our part, then we will be held to account. My friends, God is calling us to be faithful watchmen and reliable ambassadors now more than ever, especially in the epicenter. Which brings us to our first question. What does the future hold for Israel and her neighbors? Now, the mission of the Joshua Fund, it, we're a nonprofit organization. People say, oh, Joel, you've written all these books that seem to tell the future. You must be a prophet. No, I run a nonprofit. <laughs> so just to be clear, and the Joshua Fund is a nonprofit. And, it, and, we, and my wife and I founded it in the summer of 2006. Why? To mobilize and educate Christians to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, according to the Abrahamic Covenant. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, in which, uh, you know, through the Abrahamic covenant, right, all the families of the earth can be blessed through the Messiah, which comes through Abraham's line. Israel and her neighbors. For us, it is not either or. It is both and. Sadly, I, I, find, it, uh, I find it astonishing, but I find it all too often the case that, that Christians who love Israel have little or no understanding of or empathy or sympathy for or love for Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, Iraqis, Jordanians, uh, Egyptians, or others. They, they get so excited, some, I'm not saying this is of everybody, but far too often, get so excited about what God is doing in Israel and among the Jewish people that they are blind to or perhaps insensitive to or the way they communicate indicates insensitivity towards the fact that anybody else lives in the area and needs Jesus too and that many of them are, well, some of them are followers of Jesus. This is a problem. 
And, 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 and the, the reverse is true as well. People who say, well, I love the Arabs and you know, I stand with the Palestinians. And, and well, the Israelis, you know, they're, they're, you know. So this is a problem, this either or mentality. It's not biblical. It's not. And, and this grieves me because it doesn't reflect the heart of God, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Okay, yes, Bethlehem is now a Palestinian authority. Uh, I mean, it's a Palestinian city under the Palestinian authority. Uh, well, shouldn't we love the people of Jesus' birthplace, right? Even if we love Israel, we should say, well, these are people who need Jesus, and we have one right here, who born and raised in Bethlehem. Now, I think the hospital was available, and they had, you know, a place in the inn, you know, so he's got a home, but it's challenging to be a follower of Jesus and a proclaimer of the gospel in Jesus' uh, birthplace. It's challenging. Shouldn't we love them and help them, stand with them, pray for them? Same thing, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth is now largely an Arab city. It's in Israel. It's, a, it's an Arab city. Well, shouldn't we still love, I mean, you know, I, I hate to even have to say this, but shouldn't we love the people of Nazareth? This is Jesus' hometown. Don't, you, I don't know where you're all from, but don't you love your hometown? So wouldn't you want, if people there didn't know Jesus, wouldn't you want somebody to come along and, and, and preach and make disciples in your hometown? Uh, it, it, this is a problem when people look at it uh, like, oh, well, I, we don't do that because we do this. No, look, Jesus traveled into southern Lebanon, right? That's, that's, he went there meant to preach, to heal. Shouldn't we love the people of Lebanon? Gee, you know, I'm going to be in Egypt uh, in a few weeks. Uh, a, a few months ago, I, got, I met uh, Egyptian President el-Sisi, and, uh, and I had this conversation with him, that, commending him that, you know, for all the... He's fighting terrorists and all kinds of things, but he's also meeting with Jewish leaders. Uh, the president of Egypt is meeting with Coptic Orthodox uh, Christian leaders and, and with, uh, with Catholic leaders, invited the Pope. I said to the president, uh, El Sisi, uh, I noticed you haven't really met any evangelical leaders. Now, I'm not being critical. I'm just, we probably haven't asked, our, if, would you like that? So I said, would you like that? Would you like to meet some evangelical leaders? And he said, I would love that. In fact, Joel, I would like you to bring a delegation to Cairo to do that. And, uh, and, and so we're gonna do that. <laughs> Look, the only reason I say that is because one of the first things I wanna share with them, aside from what, it is, what does it mean to be an evangelical, is, hey, Jesus came to Egypt. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they've been here. And uh, that's pretty cool, right? You can't say that about every country. You can't say it about Costa Mesa. I realize when two or more are gathered, he's here. So <laughs> welcome, Lord Jesus. I'm just saying physically, he was in Egypt. Shouldn't we love the people of Egypt? And of course, Jesus traveled across the Jordan River, right? To preach and to heal. Shouldn't we be willing to cross the river as well and love and encourage the church in Jordan and, and help them reach their people? Look, and, that's, and, the, and the, in Matthew chapter 4, the message of the gospel of Jesus spreads throughout all of Syria. Does any country need the love and the healing of Jesus more than Syria today? Look, this is my point. You cannot be either or. You can be, but you shouldn't be. Okay? We should be both and. So when I say that the Joshua Fund is called to bless Israel and her neighbors, what I mean by that is that the Lord has called us specifically uh, not only to strengthen and encourage and pray for and invest uh, in the, the work that God is doing in Israel. We, we certainly do that and we love that. By God's grace, we try to help. But we are also called to strengthen the church to fulfill the great commission amongst the neighbors. Why? Because God loves Palestinians. God loves Lebanese. God loves Syrians. He loves the Iraqis. He loves the Egyptians, the Jordanians. He loves these people. He died for these people. He wants these people to know him. And, and, it, and it breaks his heart. It grieves his heart when we, when we let ourselves advertently or inadvertently find ourselves in an either-or position. It's just not the heart of God. Now, over the past decade or so, uh, I've been doing a series of in-depth studies of every prophecy of every country that the, the, the Joshua Fund focuses on. Others, too, uh, but we are focusing on Israel, uh, the Palestinians, and, of course, these five uh, Arab countries that neighbor it. Uh, and it's been fascinating. It's been sobering because 
these, these, um, these, these are sobering prophecies. Uh, I, it's beyond the scope of us tonight or this conference to, to take you through all these prophecies. It's taken me a decade. I've been studying prophecy for probably a quarter of a century. I, I didn't grow up in a church that, that I recall focused on it or taught it or even talked much about Israel. I didn't even know I was Jewish until I was 12 years old. You're like, your name is Joel Rosenberg. You must have been the dumbest kid in the fifth grade. Well, oh, nevertheless, I still didn't know because my parents had failed to mention it. So that, that's another topic for another time. But my point is, I, I didn't grow up in a church that was like, oh, wow, so exciting. Jews, we need to help them find Jesus. But they didn't talk about the Arabs either. So I began to get there through prophecy. Uh, and, and that began about a quarter of a century ago. But 10 years ago or so, I began to focus specifically on, I better understand everything that God has said about these particular countries. So while it's beyond our scope to talk about all of it, I want to talk about, I want to just draw out briefly four truths that have emerged uh, uh, in, in my studies. First, the prophets make clear that God will shake Israel and all the neighbors around her, all the nations around her, in the last days. Okay? The prophet Amos says very specifically, God says through Amos, for behold, I will shake the house of Israel. You know, people say, oh, Bible prophecy is too hard to understand. Really? That's, that's too hard? I will shake the house of Israel. Now, I'm not saying I'm, you know, people might not be happy about that sentence, but it's fairly clear. You do not need a lot of letters after your name to understand that sentence. All right? God says he's going to do it. Now, he also says through the prophet Haggai, chapter 2, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations. All the nations. None will be left out. So certainly not Israel's neighbors. So he singles out Israel, but then he adds in, uh, listen, I'm going to shake everybody. I think we're being shaken right now. Uh, and is there any question that Israel and her neighbors have been, are, are, that they shaking has begun already? No, it, it obviously, uh, the epicenter is being shaken right now and has been for some time. The study Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Study the minor prophets and the words of Jesus and the Apostle Paul and certainly, of course, the Apostle John uh, writing the Revelation. You will be astonished by the enormous number of specific passages describing the specific traumas that will come in the future to these particular countries in great and sobering detail. But I believe so much of it is already in motion. I'm not saying every prophecy has come to pass, but the shaking that God says will be signs that were leading up to the return of Christ, that's in motion. Now, you know, I, I would say that the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic Caliphate in World War II, that was, that in many ways was the beginning of the great shaking of the modern Middle East, and it continues right up to this present moment. But again, these are birth pangs. Much more is coming. The shaking will only intensify, and this should be a wake-up call for all of us, especially for the church. These are the very signs the Lord said would happen that we would see as we get closer to the day of the Lord. Now, that's the first thing, that God is going to shake Israel and the nations. Second, the prophets make clear that God will judge Israel and all the nations around her in the last days. Okay? Consider the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and with all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. Again, it's not rocket science. He's pretty clear. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, now, I'm, parap I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm going to not do the whole prophecy. I'm going to just make the comparison that, that Jesus makes. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, 
accursed ones into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus does not use that particular passage to go into details of uh, people rejecting the gospel or accepting the gospel. In that passage, he's actually talking about the fruit of the gospel, people who are showing compassion to the poor and the needy and the prisoners and so forth. But the, the overall concept is clear. He's coming, he will judge all nations, and people that have followed him, you know, wonderful. And those that didn't, not so much. Look, what, what you get out of this in the totality of the whole council of scripture is that no nation will elude God's judgment or his justice. Not a single country. Not, nor will any individual be able to escape from his judgment. Every sin, every injustice will be accounted for. No injustice will, be, uh, will go unpunished except for those who have accepted the atonement of Christ's blood on the cross. Th those, will be, those will be unaccounted for because those will have been covered by Jesus. But any other sin by a nation, by an individual, nations are really, you know, the amalgam of individuals, uh, that will be judged. Nobody gets out of that. Not Israel, not the neighbors. So if we truly love the people of the epicenter, and we truly believe what the Bible teaches from Genesis through Revelation, we do them no favors by concealing the truth of the coming judgment. In fact, we bring judgment upon ourselves. Not eternal judgment, but whatever that accounting is that God says will come if we don't warn people of what's coming and give them the way of escape, Jesus, then we will be held to account. Now, even as we teach these things and tell these truths, let us never be harsh or condemning but always be speaking the truth in love, just as the Apostle Paul commanded and as he modeled. Third, the prophets make clear that God will save souls in Israel and in all the nations around her, that he will do that. It's not open for question in the scriptures. Yes, shaking, yes, judgment, but yes, redemption, salvations. To me, this is one of the most exciting truths revealed in the prophecies. And sometimes people who teach prophecy get so focused on the judgments, they forget, overlook, ignore, whatever, the, the, the hope inside of that, which is that there are, the passages are clear. People are going to get saved, right? The, the most famous passage of this, of course, is in Revelation chapter 7, uh, 9 through 14. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, saying, and crying out to the Lord with a, with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to his lamb. Okay, did you, did you get that? A great multitude from every nation, from every tribe, from every people and language group. So we know, and it's such a great multitude, John says, no one can number this. Now these are the people who come to faith, specifically in this passage, they come to faith during the tribulation, they're being martyred for coming to Christ. And there's such a huge number, he can't count it. Now, Lynn and I are not math whizzes. We, we wish you didn't have to deal with numbers at all. We hire people, thank God, to run the Joshua Fund who know about numbers. But there is a whole book of, in the Bible called Numbers. So we're like, all right, I guess you have to know something. <laughs> Whatever. But anyway, the point is, John knows how to count, okay? Because just a few pages away from this passage, he describes 200 million demonic horsemen. Don't ask me exactly what that means. I'm just looking at the number. He can count to 200 million. So he can, he can count high. But his point is, so many people come to faith in Jesus during the tribulation. Not those that got raptured out. This is after that. From every tribe, from every people group, from every nation. This is encouraging. This is really encouraging. It's such a fascinating passage 
because it's our assurance that God will not only save people from every single epicenter nation, but that he will do so even in the worst period of shaking and judgment in all of human history. What's more, it tells us something profoundly important. Some of the seeds of the gospel that we plant now will not bear fruit immediately, but will bear fruit only as we get closer to the day of the Lord, which is why we must remain faithful now to preaching the gospel and strengthening our brothers and sisters in the region to do the same and to, and to plant seeds everywhere and to not grow weary in well-doing. Because let's just say we're the generation. I, I'm not saying we know this, right? I, I don't know that we are the one generation that's going to be raptured. I would love that. I would, I mean, would, you know, of course you'd love that. I was with Tim LaHaye at a conference uh, a few months before he passed, and I thought, well, this would be a good time to be raptured. <laughs> I'd love to go up with him. He told me, not at that conference, but previously, we'd been friends for two decades, and he said uh, he, he doesn't want to be uh, he doesn't want to die. He didn't want to die naturally. He always wanted to have a big project to be sharing the gospel with, in some big way to sort of stall God so that he could get raptured. <laughs> and after he passed uh, and went home to be with the Lord, I actually felt a little bit bad for him briefly <laughs> until I remembered that he gets to rise first. So I don't know why he was so big on the rapture. I mean, God bless him, but I'm just saying he gets to go up first. So we, we will follow as you know. So, okay, now consider too Isaiah 19. Now this is one of the most interesting passages and one of my favorites in scripture. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, all the trauma that's coming upon Egypt, but I wanna read a few verses that often are just, we just don't pay attention to them in evangelical teaching. Isaiah 19, beginning in verse 19. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of their oppressors, he, the Lord, will send them a savior and a defender and he will deliver them. And the Lord himself, the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship with sacrifice and offering. And they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. And they will return to the Lord, and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. This is absolutely extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Egypt is, is, the, is the center of, 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 of Sunni uh, Islamic teaching and education. It, it, it is arguably one of the, if not the leader of the, of the Arab world. And God says, yeah, hard times, shaking, judgment, as with every other country, including Israel. But this language is spectacular. God will strike, but he will heal. He will draw Egyptians to himself. And it says then, as you begin to look at the aftermath of this great redemption, this great awakening in Egypt, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria. Now, there is no current nation state of Assyria, but of course, we know uh, there are Assyrian people. We know there was an Assyrian empire. And this is basically Lebanon, uh, uh, Jordan, Syria, uh, Iraq, that, that sort of crescent. This is Assyria. Egypt and Assyria will be connected. And this is referring, uh, I believe, to the millennial kingdom. And Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. And we know they'll be worshiping the Lord. It's not like you know idols or anything. And then it's not over. And then it says, in that day, that's eschatological language, in that day, the day of the Lord, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. That's pretty strong language. God is saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, 
incredibly exciting, and Israel, my inheritance. My friends, that is the Middle East peace plan. Okay, that's it. It's not just Israel, it's Israel and these neighbors, and God will redeem from each one of these countries and bind them together when Jesus rules from Jerusalem. This is what we have for, to look forward to. Now, will God shake the nation of Egypt? Yes, this is what the prophets say. Does Egypt, like all other nations in the epicenter, face judgment? It does. But God has promised to save Egyptians and give them a glorious future and a hope as they give their hearts to Jesus. That's what the text says. And this passage, along with passages like Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Jeremiah 48 and 49, Romans 11, 26, and so many others, these are our great hope. This is the great hope for the people of the epicenter. And today we are seeing what might be called the first fruits of salvations in the region, but a great redemption, a great harvest of souls is ahead of us, and I am incredibly excited about this. Now fourth, the prophets make clear that the Lord Jesus Christ will not only return to earth, but he will establish his kingdom. And he will reign from Jerusalem, and he will establish justice and righteousness. The scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ will come with power and great glory. He will come to put an end to injustice. He will come to make all things right. He will establish peace, and they will hunger no longer, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them. Now, that doesn't I mean, in Southern California, that's important. Uh, where I grew up in Syracuse and Rochester, New York, we, we didn't understand that passage. The sun is, I'm sorry, what about the sun? It, you know, okay, whatever. But I mean, in the Middle East, you know, that's important. Uh, so the sun won't beat down on them. There won't be this terrible heat. For the lamb is in the center of the throne and he will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is what we long for. Our struggles are real and they're painful, but if we're believers, they're temporary. The nations and, and the kingdoms of this world struggle and fight, nowhere more so than in the epicenter. But why should we fear when the kingdom of Christ is coming? Yes, the Hebrew prophets record many hard truths, painful truths, truths that sometimes we do not wish to hear. Hard times are coming. But through those very same prophets, the Lord spoke of a better world, a world to come, a world made right, especially in the epicenter, and a king who calls us his sons and daughters. Ultimately, this is the future of Israel and her neighbors. And as we preach and teach the gospel of the kingdom, let us never lose sight of this glorious hope. Which brings us in our final moments in this uh, message to our second question. What are the practical implications of these prophecies for you, for me, for the church in North America and around the world? That is, how are we supposed to spend or, or better yet, invest our time, our talent, and our treasures more effectively in the light of what the scriptures say will, is, is coming to the people of the epicenter? Well, here we find in the scriptures four specific calls to action. And I'm just going to mention them in passing here because throughout the course of the conference, I think you're going to see that we are going to be unpacking these four in, in a variety of different ways. So I'll just mention them as we close, th to close this message. And then you're going to hear from two of our brothers uh, in just a moment. Of the four, first, in light of what we know to be faithful watchmen and ambassadors, we absolutely must reach every Jew and every Gentile of every kind in the land of Israel and throughout the Middle East with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not an option. This is our mandate. Second, we absolutely must strengthen the church in the epicenter and help them fulfill the Great Commission. Right? These aren't optional. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Third, we must show the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ to the poor, to the needy, to widows and orphans, 
to Holocaust survivors and refugees from Syria and Iraq and so forth. This is the work of the church. I'm not talking about public policy. I'm talking about what is the, how do we follow the teachings and the model of Jesus in the region, in the region. Part of our upcoming trip, taking evangelical leaders over to the region, we will not only be in Egypt meeting with Christian leaders there, Egyptian Christians, as well as government leaders, but we'll go, Lord willing, over to uh, Jordan, and we'll be meeting with uh, government leaders and Christian leaders in Jordan. Uh, and we'll, Lord willing, be going to one of the refugee camps to understand firsthand what is happening. Because this is what God tells us to do, and this is what Jesus modeled. Fourth, we must demonstrate that we are the true and faithful followers of Jesus Christ by operating in John 13 love and John 17 unity. Again, we'll talk about it more uh, throughout the conference, but just, you know, John 13, we know the passage a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to want, love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then, of course, Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, the disciples' sake, our sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Again, he's saying, I do not ask for these only, the disciples at the you know, Last Supper, at the Passover Supper, but also for, those, for all those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. That they may all be one, just as you Father and I, I'm sorry, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, I want to leave you with this question. If Israeli and Palestinian believers cannot love one another, if we cannot truly love and care for one another and operate in grace and in unity, and truly demonstrate the peace of Christ in our own personal relationships and ministries, in spite of our theological differences, our political and personal differences, and pains and stories, how can we ever persuade our peoples that we really know the true Messiah, that we really know the Prince of Peace? When it comes to the future of Israel and the neighbors, Let's be honest. The biblical prophecies are sobering. They are hard to hear. They are hard to teach. Hard times lie ahead for all of us who live in that part of the world. But there is hope. God will save many. And then he will send his son, the king of kings and the lord of lords. He will reign from Jerusalem over the entire world and he will make things right. So let us therefore be faithful in strengthening the church in the epicenter, both Jews and Arabs and, and all other ethnic groups. Let us help our brothers and sisters in every way we can to fulfill the Great Commission, come what may. This is the work of the Joshua Fund. This is the focus of this epicenter conference. And personally, I can think of no other higher calling. Amen.